Okay, this is my episode two debrief of The Vow. Uh, This one definitely fucked me up a lot. That trial was basically over three years ago, but man, it brought a lot of shit up. And I can honestly say that being on that stand for four days or five days over a space of like a week and a half was definitely one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, Where do I start? Well, let me go in order as the episode unfolded. Seeing the cats that uh, were in the scene with Nancy Salzman at the very beginning, those are actually Lauren's cats. And seeing those cats just really made me fucking sad. I think it's because there's a couple of things. The cats were so fucking weird. And and Lauren really loved those cats. But the thing that struck me is that nobody who was very close to Ranieri could get any kind of animal without his permission. So he would have had to approve approve those cats. And I was wondering, like, did he actually, did he suggest those cats as some fucked up joke? Because, man, those things are monstrous looking. Um, and as the trial unfolds, the, the more stuff will come out about, you know, him promising people babies and never delivering um, except at the end, and maybe cats and things like that were surrogates. Just it's, it's all very fucked up. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but the vocals, the opening titles, that's Bonnie, um, uh, in a collaboration with Sunlux. Very haunting hearing her voice every time, and so fucking sad. But she did an amazing job. The other thing that I wanted to just point out, a lot of people have probably seen the um, that star, the, which is the Nixium star, that was designed you know, many years ago before I got there. And what's sad about it is that the star was designed to be about interdependence, that every point um, related to every other point. Everything was connected. And so... The, the thing we were being sold was that we were building this interdependent world where we, we were ecological, I should say, we were ecological thinkers thinking about how all things connected, which on the surface is a really beautiful dream, right? And that's what that star was and what it represents to me now in terms of the way it feels is just horrible. But that was the dream that we were being sold. There was a moment... Uh, when you first meet Nancy in this episode, where you see that little box, and on the box is engraved, um, Joy is Unencumbered Love, KR. That was usually um, it was usually Pam Kafritz or, or Mariana Fernandez who, who designed those things. Um, he had all these platitudes that he came out with, and people got fixated. Because understand... Every single time he showed up, there were probably 10 or more people taking very careful notes of every single thing he said, categorizing it in a certain way, um, and then discussing it afterwards. So all these sound bites would be pulled out. And the thing is, it seemed like, based on what he said, that this was a man who was deeply, deeply emotion, emotionally connected, but I promise you there's fucking nothing in there. Those are just platitudes that he came up with in some way, read somewhere, but he did not feel any of those things. We, on the other hand, did feel them very deeply. Mostly my experience of seeing this episode is just profound sadness. And I, and I don't even know yet how to unpack why. I mean, I think it's because I'm seeing so many familiar people and so many familiar places. Um... Just such sadness, such sadness again for the dream that was sold and what it actually was, because it really, really damaged um, the dream that people had and the dream in their entire life. I mean, it really affected me, for instance, in terms of like dreams of a better world or dreams of like what we could become as as a a, a you know, global people. It just fucked all of that up. It is incredibly triggering 
to watch Nancy Salzman in teaching mode. Um, that shit just, man, that fucked me up. Because, and most of what you're seeing, I didn't shoot most of that, the sort of module stuff that you're seeing. I shot the, the, the very last stuff, the stuff that was like super glossy with the black background. I shot that. Um, but you have to imagine listening to these videos hours and hours and hours um, every day. It really gets gets into you and it really it really it fucks you up. And so, having left and so much time having passed, now watching her teach again is it it fucks me up for sure. Um, it feels a little bit like you know Clockwork Orange, you know, being forced to look at shit again. Um, the other thing I think that people are finding as well, probably, because I've gotten this morning like hundreds of messages uh, from different people about Nancy Salzman. For me, watching her is a little bit like watching someone who doesn't quite understand what's going on, um, who's like confused. The other thing is, you know, her telling the story of how she met Keith Raniere, I mean, that's also just fucking triggering. And the reason is because I've heard that story so many times. I mean, so many people have heard that story. So I imagine for a lot of people that were in for some time, it's, it's probably like, it brings up a lot of shit. She mentions at one point that she uh, was a master NLP trainer. Wow, I can hear the wind. There's a massive storm here right now. There's been thunder and now the wind is howling. And I could hear it through the fireplace vents. Um, so she talks about NLP. And so she was allegedly an NLP master trainer. And when we were inside, we were told that all the material was unique. And that there was only one module that had borrowed from NLP, which was communication and being in cause. But that was wrong. That was, that was a lie. Um, a lot was taken from NLP. I believe a lot was taken from Scientology and psychology. Um, also, it's interesting. I see people online commenting about how NLP is pseudoscience and doesn't work. I think it's people that are very attached to traditional psychology or maybe pharmacology, if you know what I mean. Um, what I will say is NLP is certainly effective enough to completely fucking brainwash people. So there is that. So it's doing something. Um, also, the explanation of NLP in this episode is very, very simple, very simplistic. It has to be because, you know, you have to keep the story moving. But th there's a lot more to it, and it's actually quite fascinating. When Nancy says um, about Keith Raniere that he understood the human psychodynamic in a way I've, I've never seen anyone understand it. It's so interesting because he did understand a lot of it, but in a very conceptual way. And he understood a lot about how we operate it because he is not encumbered by normal human emotions. So he doesn't get lost in certain, certain emotions. He watches people a bit like AI, calculating also, when he when when she talks about mirroring, you know, which is which is a technique in many in many you know human potential groups, mirroring is what he and and she were brilliant at. I mean, he was brilliant at mirroring, and it's funny because you know they teach you mirroring in the in the coaching curriculum. I I always struggled with it because I hated the idea of consciously matching what somebody else was doing to get them to feel like you were with them. To me, rapport is like a natural thing, and so I could never quite do it. But it's interesting to think about like what kind of mind sits there and watches people and matches their tone, their pace, their body language. You know, that's that's a that's a very different kind of um, mind that does that. And I will say that that Nancy Salzman was really, really good at it. I mean, you had a conversation with her. And you also felt like, oh my God, this woman totally gets me. She's very good at it. Something Emily Saul said, the, the journalist, she says something about it started by helping the curriculum, started by helping what happened that he suddenly needed followers. My answer is very simple. It was always there. That was always there. And Ranieri, this guy was a bad seed from early on. I mean, we as we were investigating things, you know, we heard from people that he went to school with. This guy did some fucked up shit to people. He was 
he tortured people emotionally, and that had been going on for a long time. Um, and it didn't just happen with this company, you know. If you if you check up on, on Tony Natale's book, I mean, she she knows a lot of the history before this shit. He'd been doing he'd been doing for a long time, um, you know. So if people ask the question of like, I think she asked the question, uh, Emily Saul was was he suddenly there, or was that the goal all along? I think that was the goal all along. I'm going to say something, and I'm going to expand on it later. In 2017, when I start to learn about DOS, I made contact with um, a, a, a defector who had left previously. Um, we used to call her Deep Cover. And she told me that 10 years earlier, so that would have been 2007, Ranieri had told her about a group of women that he was going to call Faust, F-A-U-S-T. And Faust, the idea behind Faust was it would be a group of women that would compromise very powerful individuals, you know, judges, politicians, that kind of thing. And I'm assuming compromise means, you know, probably sleep with them and, you know, take fucked up pictures and then blackmail them. So he was thinking of a blackmail society to influence uh, politics like 10 years earlier. So it's not that shit went bad suddenly, you know, in 2015, 2016. Shit had always been like that. This guy was a schemer, and he'd been scheming on how to use women um, to do missions like that. In fact, I'll talk at the, maybe at the, at the end about somebody who was sent on a mission. I won't mention their name. Um, so, yeah, that was always there. I think he just got sloppy, you know. I think he just wanted more and more and more and more adoration there just was never enough fuel for him. And I think that's what happened. When I'm talking about going on the stand and I'm expressing how afraid I am, I think there's a couple of things. I'm afraid to some degree because I have to face him again. And I'm not sure how much of the programming of 12 years of programming is still in me that might get activated in court. Um, and some of it does get activated. It's very interesting. I think the biggest thing that I was afraid of was fucking up. And I expressed that to the prosecutors and the agents as well. You know, there were agents from like, um, well, there were a lot of FBI agents and others, basically. And I expressed that concern. And I said, I just want to, I don't want to fuck up where this guy gets off. And they assured me that there, was a, there were a lot of people going on the stand that I was not yet aware of, which I wasn't aware. I was aware of some of the people going on the stand, but not everybody. And they said, don't worry. Uh, we're going to tell the story multiple times from multiple different angles. But even so, I was afraid that I would, what if I fucked up and I was the reason he gets off? I mean, because I, I had such a feeling of responsibility to put this guy away that that's the, that's the thing I was most afraid of. So if if he got under my skin in some ways, or, he, or his lawyers did, and I fucked up. That was what I was so afraid of. There, there was a moment, um, it's not in this season, in, in anywhere in the vow, where, see, Ranieri was, had little post-it notes and a pencil, and he had his five lawyers, and they were constantly whispering with each other. And so what he would do because he had so much knowledge about my psyche, is he would write down little notes and pass it to them. They would ask me questions, and of course, it, it would fuck me up. And one of the, the questions that was so interesting, I don't know if this was on purpose, but at one point, Agnifilo asks me what I mean. What do you mean when you say? What do you mean? What do you mean? And I just go blank. I can't process the question because... The what do you mean question was an EM question, and I had been asked that question thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times, and my whole brain went blank. And eventually he was like not understanding, and I said, I can't process that question. And I couldn't. And there were things like that that they dug into my psyche. It's almost like, you know, like the Manchurian candidate. There's things waiting there that Ranieri knew about. I'm not saying he knew about that. I think there's other things he knew about that he knew if those questions were asked, it would trigger certain things. And that's what's so fucked up about, about this particular situation. When you have somebody who studied your psyche, who's gathered information on you for 12 years, because you've divulged all kinds of shit, you know, while you're inside the system. And now he's sitting there with the defense team, 
um, giving them all the ammunition that's going to fuck you up. And that's what's so interesting because the loyalists think that he's so humble and kind and they're fucking delusional. This man just seems so calm. It's, it's, it's vulnerable, um, malignant narcissism at its fucking best. I mean, he seems so calm and gentle, but he's doing things to fuck you up on the stand. I think seeing Eduardo was very um, sad for me. Um, Eduardo is somebody I really cared about a lot. And he and I had had discussions in April and May because there were a lot of things he was seeing in the organization that were very problematic. <clears throat> and I was in April, I was starting to get a sense of something. Um, actually, April is when I really started to figure shit out. And, and so he was calling me, and I was having long phone conversations with him where I was explaining what gaslighting was and explaining what word salad was. And he was seeing it. He was seeing the problem. What I wasn't saying to him was, it's Keith, because I didn't think he could handle that. But he saw all the issues. He just didn't believe, as I didn't believe earlier, that it was Keith. He thought it was just, you know, everybody else. Um, so it's sad because in that conversation, when, when they're in the car, and I'm saying there's landmines ahead, um, he's sitting, I think he was in the, in the front seat with Nippy. He's, he's sitting in the front, like he has a front row seat to the information that's coming out. And that was five years ago that I was telling him. And, and I don't recall in subsequent conversations that I was trying to get him to join a campaign against Keith Raniere. Maybe I was. I think what I was trying to do, though, is I was trying to tell him what was going on because I believe that, that, that if he knew what was going on, his morality would be outraged. What I was so surprised at was that he wasn't outraged at all. That just blew my mind. Because I always thought of, of Eduardo as like a really good man. Um, I was just so deeply, deeply surprised that he wasn't horrified, that he rationalized every single thing away. And as I said, over five years ago is when I had that conversation with him. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty puzzling. Um, and it's funny because when I talk to him and I say, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something that's going to turn your world upside down. I assumed that he had the, the, the requisite I don't know, emotional architecture to feel that way. I mean, he didn't, um, Nippy and I were like, fucking what the fuck? It was, it was shocking. Um, but he wasn't shocked. It was, it's so fascinating. And this is such a, I mean, I hope that psychologists for years to come study this, study this case because to, to really see this, and this is not unique, by the way. This is, this is the case in, 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 in hundreds of cults and frankly, in, in, in political parties, the, sa the same kind of shit happens. And it's interesting because just to go back to the conversations we had, I, I remember saying to him, you know, your goodness is being, is being used. I was trying to get him to understand that. Um, and he saw it, which is so interesting. Then he unsaw it. I mean, I, I, I know that happens. I know that happens in abusive relationships. You know, the person sees it and then they try to unsee it. And then they have to really double down, triple down, quadruple down in not seeing it to maintain their worldview. When he says, oh, I discovered there was a sorority, maybe it was even good. I was like, motherfucker, what has happened? Like, you've become a true believer. And also what's terrifying is when you see how enchanted he is about the idea of dying for a principle. Um, and, and that's what we understood in 2017. We realized, oh, he's been prepping us all to die for a principle. And he wants to be the principle that we die for. Now, he wouldn't say that. He would say, it's, it's not about me. It's about the principle. But that's what, that's what he wants. He wants people to literally lay down their lives. He was obsessed with that monk who burns himself alive. I can't remember uh, when that was. But that monk who burned himself alive, the sort of self immolation he was obsessed with that. He showed that to us again and again and again. He would talk to all the women about Joan of Arc. You know, he was obsessed with that. And I think that would have been the ultimate compliment to him had somebody showed up outside the courthouse and set themselves on fire, I think he would have, I think it would have given him a rush 
unlike anything he'd ever had in his life before. And we, we realized that, that that's what could go on. Um, now, thank goodness it hasn't, um, but it's not over. You know, he has people that are very, very loyal to him. It's not over. The other thing that was weird was seeing Nancy Salzman's empty house. And I'd been in that house a lot. I mean, I'd shot a lot in that house. So it was so strange seeing it empty. And also, honestly, what I have to say is strange is, is watching how joyful she was about the memories of everything there. Because you see, when you understand that everything that happened was the on-ramp to horrible things, the things that felt so good don't feel so good anymore. It's sort of like, and I keep saying this, you know, if, if, if you are in an abusive relationship and the guy brings flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers and flowers, but then does horrible, horrible things to you, it's not like you keep on dreaming about how wonderful the flowers are because the flowers get tainted. They don't feel so good anymore. So it's weird to see her go into the house and be so in, in reverie about all the wonderful things because all the wonderful things are what the subversion of all the wonderful things is what led to the horrible things. And then you realize the horrible things were always there. Always. Everything was leading there. It was the slope down to this fucking hideous human Armageddon. So that's weird. It's weird to see her so thrilled by it. Um, when Nancy says that, you know, Keith Raniere was so kind at the beginning, my thought was like, well, of course, of course he was. Um, that's love bombing. I, th I, I hope that Nancy has since learned a lot about that. Um, he was like that with everybody. It was like that with me. I mean, when, when you first came in, you just thought like, oh my God, these people are incredible. They care so much. They love me so much, yada, yada, yada. It's just classic love bombing, you know. Watching Nancy tell the story of spending $20,000 uh, on the jackets, what comes to mind when I watch her tell the story um, is somebody who's always performing. She's just stuck. She feels like she's stuck in a performance. And that was how I experienced her. You know, I have had friendships or seen actors who grew up as actors on set, just grew up on set, and they have that same affliction. Not all of them, actually. That's not true. I think the ones that got lost in that and thought that that was real life um, still think everything is a performance. They still think life is a performance. You know, they, they, they can't tell the difference between being on set and like once you walk out off the stage or, you know, off the location, like now it's real life. They, they, everything just blends. And I see that with some actors and I, and I see that with, with Nancy Salzman, you know, and now I'm understanding as I look back, that was always there. Everything was a constant performance. I think it would be good for me to explain, there's a moment where she talks about um, surface structure and deep structure. I think it would be good for me to explain some of that because that's, it was kind of mind blowing when I first learned about it. I'm so visual, so let's see how this works um, on audio. By the way, this, you can also go to YouTube to watch some of these. Most of them are up as well, uh, with closed captions for people that need to read it in other languages. So the way that uh, Nancy Salzman explained surface structure and deep structure, she talked about language. And she said at the very top um, are the, the objective meaning of words. And deep down, that word has a different representation. And she would say, you know, if you look, for instance, at the, dic the dictionary definition of the word mother, objectively, um, that has a certain meaning um, related to, you know, childbirth and, you know, all kinds of different things. So, so mother, mother means something on the surface. But if you go down deep, deep into the deep structure, which is basically the, the subconscious or unconscious, the, the visceral feeling of that word, some people hear the word mother and they have a very, very bad response because maybe mother was abusive or maybe mother was absent or whatever it was. So mother feels different down there. And there's a mismatch between the objective meaning of mother and that deep feeling of mother and, and, and what it was about was about we, we, have, we create meaning about certain things and that meaning is what causes 
um, you know, us to suffer, to have pain, to whatever it is, to have emotional turmoil. And so the thing to do is to, to take the charge off that by lining up the two things, lining up surface structure and deep structure. But understand, in order to get into deep structure, it's kind of like transinduction. You go down deep, 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 deep into very, very primitive parts of your brain, so to speak. That's not strictly true, but I'm just saying that your brain, um, to, to, to how you feel in a very, very primitive way about things. Now, the idea was, you know, to help the person deprogram that thing, th those things, so that you didn't have an upset every time you saw something or you heard something. So when you look at like the work, work of Ivan Pavlov, this is all stuff we learned in ESP, you know, we have these Pavlovian links where we hear certain things, we see certain things, and we have bad reactions to them. Reactions that are not optimal that keep us from, you know, being successful or whatever it is. And the idea was to, to break those associations that were not correct, so to speak. Now, they were the ones determining what were correct and not correct. And in the same way that you could deprogram somebody, you could program somebody. Um, if you go back to Pavlovian links, I'm just, I know I'm geeking out, just stay with me. If you go back to Pavlovian links, one of the ways she explained a Pavlovian link, Nancy Salzman, was, you know, if you grow up with um, parents and, and the only time they ever tell you they love you or use the word love is when you're being spanked. So you do something and they take you, you know, over their knee and they whack, 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 spank, 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 and they say, I love you, spank, spank, spank. I'm only doing this for your own good, spank, spank, spank. This hurts me more than it hurts you. And so that's the only time they use the word love. Now what happens as you grow up is you believe that that pain is the same as love, that the concept of love has pain in it. So now you're trying to have relationships as you're older, but for some weird reason, every time you get in a relationship and you start to feel a certain closeness with somebody, you, you have emotional and physical pain in your body and it makes no fucking sense. And that's an example of a Pavlovian link. And the idea was to be able to break those. Now, what's so very, very fucked up, at the same time, they're talking about stuff like that, you're being programmed, especially in the later curriculum, like ethicists and things like that, to, f to believe that um, love is pain. Your, your ability to, to, to deal with pain is equal to love. So it really, really messed with your psyche because in one way you're being programmed one way or deprogrammed one way and then reprogrammed in the same fucked up direction. It's, it's very, very confusing. And so you can see why people you know, who come out of these kinds of environments struggle for a long time as, as I did. So, you know, going on to something else Nancy said, she says at one point, if people could understand each other, I'm reading this, if people could understand each other and the human struggle, by that she means the human behavior equation, we could resolve any problems, any problems in the world. And that was one of the dreams that I was really sold on. The idea that, you know, you look at like, you know, politics especially, you have people that behaving like little children running the world. And you have people in very powerful positions just generally, I mean, you know, charities, NGOs, politics, whatever it is, corporations, making very, very rash decisions. And sometimes, you know, maybe they were psychopathic or sometimes it's because they, they, they just didn't know how to be any different. And so the idea was going in to hack the, the, the architecture of people's emotions so that they could behave more compassionately, more ecologically, more empathically. So that was the dream that we were being sold, that this tech could do that, which I'm sure many people in Scientology probably feel the same way, because um, I think a lot of Scientology includes those kinds of ideas. What is so sad is that that's what was being sold. Um, but we were just, in essence, being head-fucked ourselves and head-fucking each other. And, and that's, that's, that's still, I think, something people struggle with. And that's, I think, what some of the loyalists may still really be stuck with, is they're still stuck with a dream. And they're, they're so terrified of, of seeing that, it's, that this is not that, that they have to deny all kinds of things. Um, because as you can see when you watch this episode, there is a vast amount of denial going on. So back to Ignifilo, you know, um, you heard me in the last episode talk about my, some of my feelings. When Ignifilo talks about having a conversation with Keith, and he says, you know, Keith said something very smart. And I'm like, motherfucker. Oh, God, that's sad. And Keith, and Keith talks about this as a family feud, and Agnifilo really likes that idea. It's a family feud. 
like the family's doing stuff to each other. So, you know, it's fine. And I was thinking to myself, okay, so if a family is killing members of the family, for instance, that that's okay too? I mean, but that logic is so fucking stupid. But I think that's what he was trying to sell. He was trying to, Agnifilo was trying to normalize everything. What he may or may not know is what he was basically promoting was the banality of evil. You know, just so banal. It's just this, it's just that, it's no big deal. Blackmail's fine, coercion's fine, it's okay. So he was trying to normalize everything, which is, which is what an abuser does, and that's where that legal team um, became part of the abusive system. Now, they will always say, I was just doing my job. And how many times have you heard people say, I was just doing my job? It's a fucking downfall of civilization. The disparity between what Agnifilo is saying and what is actually happening is, is staggering to anybody with conscience. Um, man, I don't know. That legal team, I don't know how lawyers do it. You know, because if you, if you finally realize it, uh, as you're nearing the end of the trial, and there were lawyers that were having, that were having reactions, by the way. There were, were lawyers on his, on his team that were reacting to the things they were, they were hearing. It, and I could see it was upsetting them. Um, how you just keep continuing is, is beyond me. Even if it's like, well, you're not allowed to recuse yourself. Motherfucker, people have recused themselves from the NSA. And gone public. And of course, they try to kill them, you know, and they're, they're hiding away in other countries. People have done it. You guys could do it too. If you were brave. All right. You know, the, the Park Plaza restaurant um, that was like a block away from the courthouse. I have actually amazing memories of that courthouse. It's the courthouse you see Nippy having lunch in. Um, I have amazing memories. You know, the, to, I was sad about a bunch of things. The one thing I was sad about was that I could not interact with anybody um, during the trial. Uh, well, actually, before the trial, up until I came off the stand. So I never got to hang out with, with Nippy. I was aware he was there. Um, you know, he, he and I were texting, but, but at a certain point at the very beginning, I said, I, we can't talk about anything. He said, what? I said, I'm sorry, man, we can't talk about anything. And I couldn't, I couldn't really talk to um, the VAW crew either, um, and, and I let them know. I said, I can't talk to you about stuff anymore. You guys can shoot me doing my thing, but I can't really talk to you anymore until, until I'm off the stand. Then we can talk until the cows come home. But I have amazing memories because after I got off the stand, Bonnie and I would go there a lot. We'd have these amazing lunches. They had the best curly fries and like, um, you know, club sandwiches and tuna melts and stuff. And, and we'd wait in the park plaza as our friends came out of the courthouse to basically give us a debrief of everything that just happened. So as the journalists were writing everything up, our friends were coming and telling us, you know, and because we have intimate knowledge of these people, um, we were really getting the story of what was happening in, in the courthouse. And I have strangely good memories. And I think because for me at that point, the worst was over and I could really start to listen to a lot of things and take information in because leading up to the trial and during the trial, I was in a complete media blackout. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't, well, I could read stuff, but I was told, don't read anything. Do not, they said to me, do not read anything because it's not going to help you at all. And later when I read the stuff that was written, I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I can see why they said that because people are just vile. People are vile about stuff that they don't have a lot of information about. Um, Sylvie being the first one up in the trial was genius. And, you know, just to go back to, trial prep, you know, and me being so nervous. At one point, one of the prosecutors said to me, look, you're a filmmaker. Let me, let me explain how it works. We're making a movie here and we're building, we, we, we put in characters and we're building the story. And the idea was that I was going on the stand first. And that's what was so terrifying is that I was, I was going to be the first one up. And at the last minute, they said to me, I think we're going to make a change. And they put Sylvie in before me, which I think was brilliant because Sylvie was like the, the horrifying teaser to the movie. It was just like, what the fuck? And then I came in after for multiple days to basically explain 
the structure of everything and then my experience of what I found out. See, they, they kept on uh, objecting to what I was saying and then the prosecution would say, he's just sharing his experience, he's just sharing his experience. And the idea was for me to set up from my perspective as a high-ranking former member what I thought this thing was and what I discovered. And so I was, to some degree, a tease of all the stuff that was going to come after. And so many of you have probably not read the court transcripts. So I'm not going to tell you what comes after because I think it's more interesting to, to watch the vow as it goes. And I'll talk about things as they, as, they, as they happen. But Sylvie is a incredibly brave human being. And it was so fucking painful um, um, hearing the things that she said on the stand because she is the kindest, sweetest human being you'll ever meet in your life. Um, and the, the level of abuse that, that he did towards her is so, so severely fucked up. And the way you can see it was enabled by Claire Bronfman and, and, and some other people was just horrible. Um, she is exceptionally brave. Exceptionally brave. You have to understand... Most of us were not required. We didn't have to go on the stand. Um, in the case of, certainly, I'm going to just talk about what's on the vow right now. In the case of Sylvia and myself, we did not have to go on the stand. It is entirely voluntary. And for, for women who um, have ever gone public about abuse, you know what a fucking treacherous thing it is to go public about extremely difficult and intimate things. It takes a level of bravery that frankly I don't think a man will ever understand. And as I say this, I don't think I understand it. I just have the best approximation of the kind of emotional difficulty and shame, and especially because you're going to get questioned and challenged about everything you say as though you're lying. That The assumption is always when a woman goes on the stand and says this thing happened to me, the assumption is always she's lying. That's what the defense team is always trying to do. And frankly, that's sometimes what the media is trying to do as well. You guys in media, man, that's another fucking story. Um, yeah, so look, she was exceptionally, exceptionally brave. Really, really irked me in that footage from years ago, 2006, I think it was, at, at V Week, the, the marathon, when, when Ranieri says to Sylvie, you know, even an extra pound makes a difference. And I'm like, motherfucker, I wanted to slap him so bad. As they say in Afrikaans, give him a fucking snot lap. Um, you know what a snot club is? Um, I'll, I'll link a video in the show notes. A snot club is, is, is an important thing. And he, he needed it and he still needs it. But apparently he's getting it in prison now. Um, Sylvie was extremely skinny. Extremely. And, and, you know, he had this obsession with very skinny women. And, but the thing is, they were never skinny enough. He wanted to literally have them look like, he was trying to get them to look like some kind of weird corpse, you know, almost just like translucent and like almost fading away. Um, and, and he was trying to get many of the women just keep on losing weight, keep on losing weight, keep on losing weight. And I mentioned, you know, in my letter to the inside, I think it was the first part, some, some of what I found out is that, you know, one person that left years before said that if, if she was a tiny bit overweight in any way, his version of overweight, he couldn't get it up. So this guy had a serious Pavlovian link that he couldn't get a boner unless a person was like on death's door. That's, that's, kind of, that's how fucked up he is. That's some seriously dark shit. You know, when, when the mission statement starts getting talked about... Um, and I did mention, you know, when I read the mission statement in court, it was, I didn't read it, I, I read it in my mind, it was, it was very hard. But when it gets talked about, um, the whole idea that anything that happens to you is your fault, is created by you, that's basically DARVO, codified DARVO in a mission statement, deny, attack, reverse, victim, and offender. Um, the whole idea of being at cause and I think that, you know, NLP has their version of being at cause. I think that Scientology has their version. I think many different groups have their version. But the idea of being at cause is, you know, I say something to you. You have a reaction. Um, I am not causing your reaction. The reaction is happening inside your nervous system, inside your skin. Therefore, it is your creation. What I am saying is immaterial. 
you are causing it. You are causing everything. So the idea is that basically nothing that happens to you is actually uh, a problem. Um, you're just having bad reactions to things. That is so sad because what happens is you start to believe because in, in a weird way, you feel somewhat empowered, like, oh, so I'm the cause of everything in my life. That means I can change everything. And you start to see that you cause everything. And what Ranieri is trying to do is inoculate you against abuse. Because if you start to believe that you are the cause, then any reaction you have is your problem, which means he can do absolutely anything he wants. And when you have a reaction, he would send you off to an EM or get somebody to EM you about your reaction to something he did that was fucking horrible. And this is a very, very slippery slope. And I, and I see this in religion as well, you know, where people, you know, the, the, the priest or the cardinal or the pope or the divine whatever or whatever is like, it couldn't possibly be anything they're doing. It must be you, you lowly fucked up human, um, you know, and, and your problem is you need to see how you sinned. Um, and I, and I use the metaphor of religion a lot because it's, it's related. When Moira is talking about people she spoke to who are concerned that they've done something to cause this, um, I was so sad because I know that's true. I know that people were so brainwashed at that point that they felt that they had caused this thing. And the whole, um, the whole emotional tone... Of, of ESP in terms of, of, of Ranieri was that poor Keith, all these things that, that, that people are doing to him, and he's just trying to do noble things in the world. Poor Keith. His health struggles so much when people do these things to him. So it's interesting because apparently Keith was not at cause then, even though he sold the idea that he was the ultimate at cause person because apparently people could really affect him. Um, but we couldn't be affected by anything he did. So makes you wonder. I think that, that this is a gold mine for people who want to study coercive control or are studying coercive control. This is a gold mine of information because you're seeing it play out. Um, and if you don't know what coercive control is, go look it up. There's incredible resources. Um, I can certainly put some in the show notes. So, so back to this problem of being a victim. And, and you see... Um, you see a, a room full of women and Nancy Salzman is talking to them. And now that, by the way, I, I, that is the Jeunesse room. Now, I've never been in that room. I'd never been in that room. That room was there for years. I'd never been in that room. I'd never stood where that camera was. So that was actually my first glimpse of the Jeunesse room. I'd, I'd walked past the outside door, which is at the very back, and sort of seen you know a few things in furniture, but I'd never actually been in there. So that was kind of weird. And the whole discussion about the problem of being a victim um, that being that that calling yourself a victim is a bad thing and this this is endemic in many new age groups self-help groups religion and then Nancy you know saying that that screaming of the screaming of abuse is abuse itself that is so fucked up and in in letter to my letter to the inside um, I think it's in 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 part three I think. Um, I'm going to talk about how they did that to Bonnie, how when she started speaking up, they basically um, went after her. The entire fucking you know, wolf pack went after her, including Nancy. Um, and they targeted her for speaking out. And their whole, there was a whole training to try to get me to, to, to turn against her, which didn't work. Um, but... That idea of the, 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 the complaining of abuse is abuse, that's narc shit. That's narc strategy. That's a strategy of, of, uh, of narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and, and people need to study it. Um, if you're always wrong and they're always right, get the fuck out. There's a problem. Some of you, I think, have also started reading on my website my letter to the judge at Nancy Salzman's sentencing, and that'll give you a little bit more information about the stuff she was doing to Bonnie, which is still one of my great upsets is, is what she did to Bonnie. Um, but it's in that letter. It's, it's how she basically came after 
Bonnie along with everybody else because Bonnie was was speaking out about legitimate concerns that were going on. And, you know, like I, I've said before, Bonnie was the canary in the coal mine and they tried to decimate her, which still, you know, to this day, to some degree still affects her, you know. The whole idea with, with being a victim is bad that, and, and trying to convince a woman that one of their weaknesses is that they want to be victims, I find so incredibly convenient for a perpetrator like Ranieri. Like how convenient that it's all your fault. Wow, what a brilliant system for a cult leader. Hmm. There was this whole concept of um, the, the induction into DOS that a woman was pitched, there's this really important thing, amazing thing. And, and Ranieri was always on about the Freemasons, you know, like the way you get invited to the Freemasons, you know, Somebody meets you one day and says, you know, I'm inviting you to something. You have 24 hours to decide, and then you'll, we'll never, you'll never hear from us again. So he, was, he romanticized the whole induction into, into Freemasonry. And so the, the way in was, you know, there's this incredible thing that's going to change your fucking life. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. But in order to hear about it, I need some collateral from you to know that you will never speak about it. Now, if you don't know what the collateral is, is necessarily at that point, or you don't know how dark it's going to get. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, that, I, I want to be part of something exclusive. I want to be part of like, you know, the the, the female version of, of of the Freemasons. Um, Ranieri's um, rationale behind collateral was that it didn't matter how much collateral you gave or how bad it was, because if you were really clear on your word, it didn't matter. Because you would never, that collateral would, collateral would never need to get used. So that was his whole rationale. Like if you're serious about something, it's not a problem, you know, basically collateralizing everything. Um, and that's the beginning of the bait and switch because, and this is what I struggle to like get law enforcement to understand is, you know, if you invite somebody to something and you say, I want a picture of this and this, you go, okay, I can do that. Now you're in. Now they have that picture. Now they keep asking you to do more and more and asking for more and more collateral. And you're still trying to figure out like, is this good? Is this not good? But like, I trust these people. Maybe it's okay. I mean, I am clear about my words. So I'm, I'm, I'm yes, okay, I guess. And it gets to the point pretty soon you realize I'm fucked, you know? And that was the conversation that, that, that I had with Sarah, um, you know, in 2017 is when we finally spoke and she told me, how much collateral she had, she had had to give. And I was like, oh my God, she's fucked. And she says, yeah, I'm fucked. And it's so interesting to have Ignifilo make light of that. Like it's not a big deal. Like it's just a family squabble. I don't know. I guess unless, unless families just blackmail each other all the time, I guess that's a family issue. But like, I don't know. Sounds like a pretty fucked up family to me. Um, a criminal one. There's an amazing friend of mine, uh, Vero, um, Mexican friend, Mexican woman. And what a brave soul. What a brave soul. You have to understand there were, there were only two Mexicans that went on camera early. Um, she was one of them. And, and Tony Zaratini was the other. There were some Mexicans later that went on camera, much, much later. Um, and the two other very, very brave people were, were not Mexican. They were from other countries in South America who lived in Mexico and, I, and they were incredibly brave and they were willing to, to do whatever it took to help. Um, they did not make the cut, but I will be forever grateful to them. Vero, super, super brave. And, and what's so great is she helps you really understand like newsflash, like blackmail is not consent. And she helps you understand line bending. You know, Ranieri and, and Nancy Salzman would talk about line bending you know, how you get a person to agree to this and then agree to this and then agree to this and agree to this. And they have a line and you just bend the line, you know. And the idea was you bend the line for their own good because their resistances will, will push up against th their, their possibility of becoming successful. So you have to line bend the resistant part of themselves towards their success. Um, but what it actually was is line bending people from their morality towards what you want. That's what they were actually doing. Um, and by the way, you know, when you look at line bending to things, the idea of consent, 
and and this really was an issue of consent. It was it was a bait and switch. You, you can't talk about consent when there's blackmail involved. I suggest everybody goes to look at the work of the Consent Awareness Network. They're on um, Instagram and probably a bunch of other other platforms as well. Um, and one of the things that they say is that the the term consent has not actually been defined clearly in the law. And so they constantly use this hashtag, hashtag FGKIA, freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. And that is what they want to get put into law as, as, as a definition of consent. It's bigger than that, but just those few words really help you understand what it is. FGKIA, freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. And that's the consent Awareness Network. Check them out. Um, and as I said, this is something I, I struggle to get law enforcement to understand. You know, you can't talk about consent when there's blackmail involved. There is no consent when there's blackmail involved. And they would say things, but they consented at the beginning. I said yes, but when they didn't know what they were what they were signing up for at the beginning, and it was a bait and switch because once they were they were in, they're fucked. You know, once you put that first piece of collateral in, which you're doing in goodwill, but you're being lied to. You're not being given all the information. It's my alarm. I have to do an alarm every 29 minutes because the, the camera cuts off. Um, so you're not being given all the information at the very beginning. So you can't possibly call it consensual. Freely given, knowledgeable, informed agreement. You have to know everything up front. Another moment that really just fucking irritated me was... At volleyball, when Ranieri, watching Ranieri talk about vulnerability and fear, first of all, he doesn't have a fucking clue what he's talking about. Um, he has absolutely no idea what vulnerability is. And you can see the way he's talking. He, he, he describes a human experience like a fucking psychopath, like he's dead behind the eyes, lifeless, like an automaton. You know, he's approximating being uh, human. Um, and, you know, with vulnerability, you know, he was, he was selling the idea of a boot camp, you know, to get over your fears of vulnerability. And he was saying, to get over your fear of vulnerability, you have to relinquish all control. And again, super, super convenient. And by the way, there are many, many religious orders and, and religious groups and cults that do this. They would take you on some retreat. They want you to relinquish, you know, all your boundaries, all your control, all your everything. Ah, it often does not go well at all. At all. Another thing I was thinking that's weird. You know, Ranieri was always wet, like here around his mouth. I'm pointing to my, oh, those of you on YouTube can see me. Those of you on the podcast can't. Um, the corners of his mouth were always wet, always moist. And I was always like, what is it? He's constantly like licking the corners of his mouth. Ugh. It was like Jabba the Hutt. You know, I always looked at it and thought, ah, that's kind of gross. But, you know, you're, you're conflicted all the time with this picture you're supposed to have in your head. So you go, okay, well, I guess that's just what it is. It's just a, it's a genetic thing or whatever. Um, when it got time to, to see Agnifilo uh, cross-examining Sylvie and trying to poke holes in her story, when he talks about her text messages to Ranieri, which, which seem very positive, um, it's so fucked up. I mean, you can see trauma bonding in action. You can see that that's what's actually, that's what was going on with her. She was trauma bonded. Um, and she has collateral hanging over her head. And this, again, is another masterclass in course of control. You know, when you look at the different responses people can have in a traumatic situation, you know, you've got, you know, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. Fawning is a very important one, and those people that understand this understand that, you know, when people are in a very dangerous situation, they might have any one of those four responses, but they might fawn. You might fawn on the perpetrator to try to feel safe. And you can see in the text messages that some of that is going on, that some of it is fawning, and some of it is also, if she doesn't follow orders, horrible, horrible collateral will be released that for somebody as sensitive as, as her, it would be devastating. And, and that's what, um, thank goodness, Moira Penz and the team understood. And I'm, I'm, not, even sh I'm not sure if, if 
the defense team understood that or even gave a shit. Um, it's fascinating, the amount of trauma that they're willing to put people through. I don't know, something fucked up about the legal system. Anyway, you'll hear me say that again and again and again. Then going in order of the, you know, after Sylvie, when I was on the, on the stand, when you see me on the stand in the, in the episode, as I said, that was just a horrible week of my life, a week and a bit. Um, one of the reasons it was horrible is I was still deeply traumatized. Um, I had not processed a lot because I had been basically in a war, you know, all that time. Um, it was nonstop. I was just going, 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 going. So I was still super fucking traumatized when I went on the stand. Um, I hadn't had time. I only really began really healing the end of that year, the end of 2019, uh, when Bonnie and I went away um, traveling and went to Portugal is when I could finally begin healing. And then it took a whole nother year of just um, not dealing with this so much to, to finally start to feel a sense, a sense of normalcy. The moment where I say, and then later on I thought, what if he's right? It was a later on thing. It wasn't when I was facing him the first time. It was, as I said in another episode, it was all the head fucking uh, from Agnifilo. And uh, it messed with my head so badly that that's when I had that thought. Um, but by the, end of the, uh, by the end of my time on the stand... Um, it all, it all cleared up. It actually cleared up pretty fast because I, I had a weekend to process that, that, that glitch. And when I went back, I felt very, very strong. And so at the end, it's true that when I was finally off the stand, um, I felt super, super clear. And I've never had that thought again. I've never had any doubt again after that. But it's interesting because the entire curriculum was designed to have you doubt yourself all the time. Every single thing you said you doubted yourself. There was, I think it was, um, it wasn't ethicist. It was some, another program where you were asked, I saw the notes the other day, you were asked to come up with a few times where you'd done the noblest thing you'd ever done in your life, where you overcame adversity to do something noble. And so, you know, you wrote down the three things and then he was actually, Rainier was actually in that training. And then he came around one by one to show us that that moment that we thought was noble actually wasn't. It was completely self-serving. And the whole idea was to, to realize you, you've, never, you've never been noble. You don't know what nobility is. Um, so the whole system was to have, you, to have you constantly second, third, fourth, fifth guess yourself all the time, constantly questioning, am I wrong, am I wrong, am I wrong? And then Ranieri would say, you know, I do that too. No, he doesn't. He says he does. Look at what they do, not what they say. Fucking golden rule. You know, when it got to the stuff about suppressive, um, that anything that you said against him or the curriculum was suppressive, um, it's really interesting. It's sort of like saying that if you challenge, let's say you're in a religion and you challenge anything about the church or anything about the priest, then the priest says, oh, you're in league with Lucifer. It's the equivalent of that. And it's really important to know that it happens right today as we, as we speak, as we, as we listen. Today it happens in the political system where somebody says one thing and they get accused of a bunch of shit that's just not true. You're in league with Lucifer. You're suppressive. Um, so yeah, speaking of something that, that was directly stolen from Scientology, that term was directly stolen Towards the very end, when Ranieri is um, talking from prison and he says, you know, he believes he has to stop me. He's talking about me. Yeah, that was true. I did. Um, but it's so fucked up when he says, you know, please don't lie. Um, and, and you can see him maintaining the position that we were all lying. I mean, I have so many messages from people this morning saying, oh, my God, that his, his insistence that you're lying. Um, he still maintains that position. And understand, the people that are loyal to him, they maintain that position as well. They think we're all lying, including the FBI, um, because they don't understand what they're looking at. They don't understand that somebody can be a psychopath and, and act human. So he insists on a certain position, and they, they buy it. They believe it wholeheartedly. 
but they've had to, to compartmentalize things so much. They've had to shove down so much. As I said before, you know, in my letter to the inside, you know, they've emed away um, a lot of conscience, unfortunately. Whether that's permanent, I don't know. Um, but they're not looking at things with a full emotional deck. They believe they are. Um, and Ranieri just insists that, that everything that's happening is a hate campaign. So anybody who says anything against him is part of a, a hate campaign. That's a political op. You know, that's, that happens in politics where, where, where somebody says something and they say, oh, well, they're just hateful. They're promoting hate. Um, that's what Ranieri does. You know, some, some of the stuff you're seeing in politics today, that's, that's that playbook. And that's the playbook that Ranieri uses very well. He always talked about towards the end, you know, we're in a war against hate. And it was so convenient because when finally we spoke out, we were, oh, well, we're part of the hate. So now they're at war with us. Really interesting for a nonviolent group, right? There's a moment where I'm in front of the class. This is in Vancouver. Um, and I'm talking about Nancy Salzman breaking my pride. And then I say she did it with love. And as I watched it, I thought, that's so interesting. That's the voice of a battered person. Um, I know people might not believe men can be emotionally battered, but uh, I'm telling you they can. Um, that's me fawning. It wasn't true. I was fawning because I got so much shit if I didn't give appropriate um, honor, tribute to, to the higher ranks, that everybody became terrified that they weren't doing enough. So what you did is you overcompensated to make sure that you wouldn't get shit for it. And if you compare what I said in that moment in front of the class to what I say in my letter to the judge at Nancy's sentencing, they're very, very different. And people sometimes you know, say things like, well, well, how could you change your mind? Well, because when I was in a coercive system, I was so terrified of fucking up that I said what I thought I needed to. I'm basically fawning, you know. And later on, I began to realize what was going on and what kinds of undue influence myself and others were under. It all began to make sense. Um, to some degree, I suppose you could say I changed my mind. It was more that I got more information about what was actually going on. Um, we were terrified of her. Um, you'll see in other things I've, I've said. I mean, Nancy in the end was like the abusive mother. Everybody was fucking afraid of her. Um, even me, big strapping man, afraid of her. The other thing I was thinking as I was looking at myself on screen, if you compare me then to me now, well, if I compare me then to me now, what I see is, is, is a man, a bit of a boy really, who's so obedient, who's so tamed. I was so tamed. I was so broken. But good news, not anymore, motherfuckers. Not anymore. Nancy playing Sarah's message when she says, would you respond to a call like that? You know, I, I sat and I thought to myself and I thought, yeah, Nancy, I would. I would. Because shit wasn't making sense to you either, right? I would. I would have done that. And it's fascinating that she's angrier at Sarah in that moment than, than Keith, which is betrayal blindness. It's part of betrayal blindness. Now, <clears throat> I, I do want to just, one caveat before the next thing I'm about to say. You're seeing a snippet of, of multiple interviews and you're not seeing everything that she said. So I understand a lot of people are super, super angry right now about what they're seeing with episode two, but you're seeing a snippet. But having said that, somebody on Twitter called uh, Slap Dash Mama said uh, four hours ago uh, with a picture of you know, Jeff Goldblum, mind blown, saying, um, wow, me discovering Nancy Salzman is also a narc. Um, I thought that was very, very funny. There were an inordinate number of uh, narcs in ESP. I don't know why. And I do know that the, the, the intake um, thing we had to fill out at the beginning of every intensive was actually uh, an NPD um, inventory form to, to test for narcissism. So I thought that was very interesting that he was testing for narcissism. I think he wanted some of that. 
because although narcissists can do enormous damage, they're actually also very controllable given the right fuel. Um, and because they love power, they'll do pretty much anything. So I think that's interesting. When Lauren lies to Nancy at the very end of the episode, you know, saying, no, Keith's not involved. I mean, she has to lie. She has to. She has to obey orders because the consequences are awful, you know. So it's really important to understand when, when, when people are asked questions like that and they lie, they're, they're lying because they have to. In the case of Lauren, because she had a massive collateral hanging over her, her head. At the end, when, when, when Nancy's talking at the very end of the episode, it, it really does look like a serious amount of delusional narcissism. Um, and in that moment, you know, it's sort of like Nancy's the ultimate victim of everybody. And again, understand that is something that Ranieri um, promoted as well. I mean, to this day, the loyalists still feel he's the biggest victim. They wouldn't say that. But he's the one in the, in the end that suffered more, you know. And in this moment, Nancy seems to be suffering more than any of the DOS slaves. But as I said, um, that's just a snippet of, of, of many, many interviews that, that, you know, lasted a long time. You do have to understand, though, that because Nancy pled guilty, her dirty laundry never came out in court. There is a lot of stuff that never came out in court because she was never examined. She just pled guilty. So there's, there's a shit ton of stuff that never made the, the light of day. And I know a lot of people on Twitter are saying, there's more, there's more. Yeah, there's a lot more. But it never made it into the trial. Um, I mean, you have to understand. Nancy was... It's really interesting. There, there was a situation where a DOS slave was sent on a mission to seduce somebody. That's how fucked up this whole thing was. Now, that same DOS slave was previously in a relationship with a proctor who um, one day walked into volleyball and saw his ex, recently ex, um, sitting on Ranieri's lap, you know, with like a, a flimsy t-shirt with no bra kind of thing, very, very sexual. And she, I believe, had been instructed to break it off with him because she was now part of DOS. I think that's my understanding. So this proctor had concerns and began asking questions and was pushing on like, what, what the hell is going on? And Nancy Salzman pulled this proctor into her office and said, um, you do not want to make an enemy of Keith Raniere. Trust me. Now, what kind of person says that? Because like, it's like you're talking about a mafia boss. What is this paragon of virtue, the most ethical man in the world who's nonviolent, what could he do that's so terrible unless she knew what he could do that was so terrible? So I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, I won't go into details about, you know, who those people are that I just mentioned, but it's a pretty fucked up situation. Um, it's, it's also fucked up. I think that, that Nancy and I, and I got, I mean, I gotten hundreds of messages this morning about this, that Nancy's upset about the company falling apart. Um, it, it is funny because we all walked away from everything we'd done because it was the right thing to do. So I, I just think that's interesting. It's an interesting, it's interesting to try to figure out like the kind of mind that says that, that that's the big concern. As I said though, that there is just a, that is just a snippet of the interview. But look, this is the way I see it. The way I see it is, is her company being destroyed actually saved her life. Um, it actually saved many people's lives. Understand a number of the women around Ranieri had died in very strange and mysterious ways. So this may have actually saved her life. I think she should be grateful. All right, listen. This was a fucking exhausting episode to watch. It brought up so much shit. It's the, it's the first one where I really felt um, sick to my stomach, like I wanted to hurl. And I think part of it was watching the, you know, the whole thing about being back on the stand. I think, you know, Sylvie's testimony, you know, seeing some of my friends... Um, who had been through so much pain, and then the deep, deep levels of denial that you're seeing from the loyalists. I think if you have a chance, 
um, there's a video on YouTube called Holy Deception on my channel. You guys should really watch that. Um, it talks about why, why they have to take the position they're taking and why they can't just say, yes, he did this, yes, he did that, yes, he did the other. They can't admit any of it. Um, they have to just basically, you know, brush it off. It's really worth watching. I <clears throat> honestly, I honestly need a break this week after this because I am like, it is the is the morning after after the episode dropped. I am just, I'm super fucked, super fucked. I need, uh, I need a break now. This one, this one really, really hurts. I really hope that you guys are getting a lot out of um, these debriefs. Um, I know that. Uh, Sarah and Nippy are doing debriefs on a little bit culty as well. You guys should listen to what they're saying as well. Um, it hopefully gives you a, a, a fuller picture of some of the stuff that's happening because only a certain amount can be in a series. There's a lot more. There is so much more that happened. Um, and again, as I, as I always say, thank you to all the people that are sending such incredible messages of support to Bonnie and myself and the other whistleblowers. It really does mean a tremendous amount to us. Um, although this happened a long time ago, we're still feeling the effects of it. And as you can see, there are people still very, very invested in protecting him. So thank you. And as always, please subscribe and we will talk soon.